Hi there, and welcome back to the Energy Sector Heroes podcast. My name is Michelle Fraser, and every week I will speak with incredible people who share their lessons, experiences, and stories from their time spent in the energy sector. Hi there, and welcome back to the Energy Sector Heroes podcast. My name is Michelle Fraser, and every week I will speak with incredible people who will share their lessons, experiences, and stories from their time spent in the energy sector. Today, my guest is Pravish Jalora. Pravish is an incredible engineering manager, project manager, with nearly 30 years experience in the energy sector. Pravesh, would you like to introduce yourself, please? So my name is Pravesh R. Jalora. So you can call me Pravesh. I am basically electrical engineering graduate. And other than this, I am certified energy auditor also. So I did my energy auditing certification in 2008. And I did my graduation in 1993. I have total around 28 years of work experience in mines and metals and oil and gas industry. I started my career with a company called Hindustan Zinc Limited. It's a largest producer of zinc and lead in India. And this is third largest producer of zinc in the world. This was a public sector when I joined this organization. Later on in 2002, this organization was taken over by Vedanta Resources Limited. Since then, this Hindustan Zinc Limited is under Mr. Anil Agrawal, who is owner of Vedanta Resources. I worked in Hindustan Zinc Limited for around 13 years. And then I joined a very large multinational organization in India. It's a basically construction company, Larson and Tubro. Here, my transition from mines and metals to oil and gas industry took place. In Hindustan Zinc Limited, I was associated with many projects. I was associated with zinc expansion project. I was associated with lead expansion project. And then I was ex- associated with the commissioning of 77 megawatt power plant. In Larson and Tubro, I started working in offshore industry. I handled project largest pipeline projects of India, ever heated pipeline projects of India. It's around 600 kilometers pipeline mm-hmm. called from Padme to Salaya. This pipeline was designed for 150,000 BOPD, barrel of oil per day. It was basically a crude line of 24 inch and we had a gas line of 8 inch. This gas line was there to charge the gas turbines. So we were generating power from the gas crude has. Other than this, I handled uh, offshore projects like MHNRD, which is for ONGC Oil and Natural Gas Corporation India. This location of this project is Mumbai High North. So it is in, I would say, that uh, Arabian Sea. This project consists of four valid platforms. These all four valid platforms were unmanned. Then I was project engineering manager for PLQP project. It's process come living quarter platform project. This project is located in Kakinada. It's in Bay of Bengal, India. Around working five and a half years in Larsen and Tubro, I joined an organization called SK Engineering Company based in Korea. I worked in this company for one year and I was working in NSRP project. It is for grass root refinery project. Then I joined CBNI. CBNI is Chicago Bridge and Iron. This company, I worked in this company, I worked with FFSKI, Hydrocarbon Complex Project. And then I worked in a mega project like Mozambique LNG. And because of you know insurgency attack, this project was suspended. And we are expecting this project to restart somewhere around next year, Q2. After Mozambique LNG, I right now working as a project engineering manager for Adnoc Fizera LNG. This plant is rated capacity for 4.8 mmTPA. Okay, so this is the brief introduction of my 
and i handled various responsibility in my career i was project manager and then i in some of the project i am working as a project engineering manager in feed project i am working as a project manager and project engineering manager too so how did you get started off in the energy sector okay energy sector is a very very wide field yeah, okay so yeah. energy sector sector is consist of power oil and gas and anything which produces the energy so you can call renewable energy is also a part of energy sector so nowadays solar plant you know wind mills are are one of the big sector which are people working on it and yeah these are we are generating lot of power from windmill and solar plants so energy sector is the basic requirement for any industrial development mm-hmm. i started working in energy sector in oil and gas 15 years back yeah but when i was working in mines and metals also being a electrical engineer we need to deal with energy all the time so mm-hmm. we are controlling the power and i worked in power sector as well i worked in power plants so how did you get started did you go to university what was your first job and who inspired you to go into the oil and gas or energy sector okay okay so basically like of course energy is as i said energy is a prime requirement for development of any industry and i would say human being okay without energy we cannot live Mm-hmm. we yeah we we have to have power we need to we have to have oil and gas okay so power is very much essential part mm-hmm. to uh, to to drive the motors and yeah to lighten the houses also houses and roads and then oil and gas is also a uh, play a very big role in industrial development without oil and gas and power you cannot live so energy sector all in all is very demanding and this is why i was always wor- wanting to work in energy sector only mm-hmm. and uh, you know being a electrical engineer i am very attached to the power sector and oil and gas industries okay who was your mo- role model during your career and why did you find them inspirational my role model during my career is none other than my boss okay so like uh, i have uh, rajendra uh, rp bindra in uh, gurgaon he is always uh, my role model he is he has very unique leadership style he is very cooperative and he is very clear what he wants and another role model is filippo di pace he is ceo of cc7 uh, europe Mm-hmm. he has fantastic knowledge of contract so since we are working in epc company especially oil and gas so knowledge of contract makes a lot of difference in success of the organization so we need to we need to know the contractual requirement and we need to know how we can create a win win situation for the client and for the contractor so okay. both are my uh, both are my role model in this uh, energy sector okay did you have any mentors during your career and what was the most important thing that they taught you yeah i have mentor in my career i worked under one of uh, the great mentor called rk bansal who was in hindustan zinc limited and who taught me the management styles so means so like uh, how to handle more resources like i when i am working in a project i used to handle 400 plus people in the project and managing all these people is a big challenge so i learned lot of techniques from rk bansal he is very uh, i would say commanding and he always said that if you want anything from the team you need to first mix with the team and here he used to share one story of football match that when you are working in a project treat project like a football match okay in football match the captain of the team also play 
the game and mm-hmm. he has mm-hmm. its defined roles and responsibility so you should know the roles and responsibility of yours and the team as well okay collaborate with the team and and you know uh, many a times we need to cover the team as well means like every team members are unique and they have unique potential so we need to know the uniqueness the potential of the team members and we need to work on their weaknesses we need to cover the weaknesses by our own means i would say that we should cooperate with the team and we need to compensate their weaknesses as well mm-hmm. okay now that's interesting and really good advice as well what is the most challenging thing about your current role and how do you handle it yeah most challenging with my current role is like as i said mcdermott is a oil and gas epc company we do provide the services to the client so understanding the contract make lots of difference when we are executing the contract and you know when uh, the client typically has habit to ask for more so we need to understand the clear cut requirement of the contract we need to know the quality procedures the time allocated to complete the project so when we are working in any of the project we should avoid the scope creeping so that we can maintain the timeline of the project and we should clearly define the roles and responsibility of the team members we should mm-hmm. have skilled resources to deliver quality product so many a times you know uh, when we are working in a contract uh, there there are some different requirement arises so we need to either politely refuse the requirement or we can ask client for change order mm-hmm. though it is very difficult to get the change orders from the client but when we have the strong basis of the changes and if we are able to convince the client that yeah if we implement these changes now this will have good result in favor of client itself so the basic challenge in executing all the project is we need to understand the requirement and manage the stakeholder of the project accordingly in my recent uh, recent career i would suggest that like okay i am executing a project with adnoc fusera lng in this project the contract has lot of gray areas so what we did is at the initial stage of the project we sit down with the company adnoc and we said that guys these are the gray areas and this is how we need to address these gray areas so finally in, i would say that you yeah, have more than 95% uh, of the issues were resolved then and there itself which makes our life easy in executing the project did i answer your question yes you did and it was very interesting thank you yes it was very inter- i can appreciate your answer as well from an engineering point of view because um, it is very difficult when you're trying to put through the changes when you're working on a project it is very difficult i just wondered how does your current role compare to your aspirations as a young boy did you always want to be an engineer or did you want to do something different okay yeah it's an interesting question i would say that yeah i always wanting to be an engineer and engineering is my passion the since childhood i wanted to become an engineer because you know in my house we have uh, so many engineers and when i see the their life uh, as a engineering profession so they, they i always find yeah it's a very i would say demanding uh, profession yeah from childhood itself i wanted to be an engineer though in childhood i was not sure whether i am going to become electrical engineer or whether i am going to become civil engineer or mechanical engineer but finally i did my electrical engineering eventually i found that project engineering is or project management is the most challenging than engineering discipline too 
and here you have a lot of roles and responsibilities you need to integrate the project as a whole you have to und have understanding of the project in total you need to know about the project requirement you need to manage the stakeholders so yeah there are uh, lot many areas to work on in uh, project management and top of it uh, you need to be always cash positive when you finish the project uh, otherwise your management would not be happy if you are not cash positive and if you are, if you are not making uh, any profit out of the project so only uh, all uh, i all, always wanted to be an uh, engineer and uh, this is a really a challenging profession overall means this is the only profession which has more challenges than any other profession okay yes it does and it is quite amazing to be an engineer as well i agree with you i was just wondering if you were going to hire someone what kind of qualities would you look for experience qualities qualifications if you were going to hire a hire someone for your team yeah okay so what i am telling you is when i am going to hire any person in my project first of all i need to know which skill set i am looking at because as i said that every individual is different and every individual has some skills in it mm -hmm. okay so whether the skills are suitable for my project or not that i need to know before i hire them okay so skill set is the prime area which i would prefer that uh, everybody should look at and then obviously we need to know whether he has worked in the similar kind of project or not like whether is like if i am hiring anyone from oil and gas industry for oil and gas project it's fine but if i hire an automobile engineer for oil and gas industry then i am making a mistake okay okay, okay. so the requirement uh, skill set requirement and the knowledge a person has and the relevant experience makes a lot of difference when we are hiring a person and top of it if it is at a uh, senior position then we need to know the attitude also so okay. many a times attitude plays more role than knowledge you know if someone is very knowledgeable and someone has skills and someone has worked in the relevant uh, area we are looking at but his attitude is not good then uh, it will be very difficult for us to take work from that guy okay so ultimately we need to execute the project and it's a team so attitude of any individual may inspire the team spirit yeah i agree okay so uh, that really makes a lot of difference when we are hiring okay thank you that's it. i agree actually it is i think the getting the right fit for the team is very very important have you had any career disasters have you any had any anything that's gone really terrible during your career yep obviously we have uh, i have encountered uh, many disasters uh, during my career i am giving you the example of uh, furnace okay so we were uh, doing a project in hindustan zinc limited it was a blast furnace and you know what happened as usual our project timeline was uh, short and we wanted to complete the project within the timeline and the furnace is refractory lining uh, inside the inside the furnace right so in order to maintain the temperature and temperature should not go out of the furnace skin there is a refractory lining and uh, the re refractory lining was supposed to be completed well within the time but yeah we completed the time uh, refractory lining but the curing time for refractory was 72 hours but we did not take care of that curing time and we charge the furnace to meet the timeline uh, you know what happens slowly slowly refractory lines got damaged mm -hmm. and it is uh, furnace started heating up eventually in uh, within 3 4 days the furnace blast uh, means furnace uh, uh, furnace blast occurred and the whole molten metal uh, which was uh, there in furnace were spread it all along and it was a casualty of around uh, five uh, uh, workers mm -hmm. okay so not only the, it's a loss to the not not only it's a loss to the production but yeah it, 
we lost some human resources too which are really very sad and we uh, as the engineer we should avoid such casualty if there are some delays it's better to tell management that there are some genuine delays and we cannot have some shortcuts to cover these delays okay and we need to upfront tell management that the if we took some if we take some shortcuts it will have so much uh, so and so repercussions so the aftermath of uh, short match uh, shortcuts should also be explained to the management mm-hmm. and yeah another incident i would suggest, uh, i would like to share with you is uh, sorry see we were in uh, one of my project what happened we were casting a foundation for compressor and you know the compressor foundation is very critical foundation we need to do dynamic analysis when we are designing the compressor foundation but the guy who was uh, designing the compressor foundation he was not knowledgeable enough to do the dynamic analysis of the foundation as a result the foundation was not adequate enough to take the dynamic loads of the compressor and when the compressor was in operation in 2 3 months time the f- compressor foundation crack occurred and the client was very upset our quality and we were asked to analyze what went wrong we went to the site and we took pictures of the foundation and then uh, we revisited our design we hired uh, some expert of compressor foundation design and it was found that we did not carry out the dynamic analysis of the compressor foundation as a result uh, the rebars which are to be there in foundation for the compression load were not there and the bonding between the concrete was not adequate enough to hold the foundation together we need to remove the entire foundation and just imagine when the plant is al- almost you know, plant is commissioned and uh, all the equipments were installed it was very difficult for us to take out the foundation and recast the foundation and then again install the compressor so uh, though we could able to do it and eventually what happened we saved the company reputation by doing all these things but yeah at some point of time client may think that yeah uh, we gave this job to so and so contractor but they did not do well in uh, compressor foundation so whatever the good work you do for the client is all in vain if you make a mistake okay so my always uh, emphasize on quality and safety aspect when we are designing anything for the client so whatever is there even if sometimes uh, the quality requirement doesn't specify about the stringent one but if it is necessary as a engineering consultant and as a contractor i prefer to take that margins and do de- oh, do sorry uh, do the design so that we don't face any problem later on okay i just wondered you said before that you didn't know what kind of engineer you were going to be whether we were going to be civil mechanical or electrical what made you decide to become an electrical engineer over all the different disciplines okay uh, in india i'm not sure whether you are uh, aware about how we take admission in india actually see now what happens in india we we take admission in engineering based on our mark we get in uh, pre engineering test mm-hmm. so there is a we normally conduct uh, government of government of india normally conduct a pre engineering test uh, test for getting admission in engineering and based on the score and the rank you get in pre engineering test your college and your branch is decided so as i said i was not fascinating about any of the branch i could get but yes electrical engineering found to be more logical and more i would say analytical branch than mechanical and civil so and you know since i graduated in 28 years back and i took admission 32 years back it was a four year degree program so 32 years back there was always a demand of electrical engineering more than mechanical and civil engineering mm mm-hmm. so okay. so based on uh, based on the rank and uh, 
demand and yep by choice i became electrical engineer okay i always find it fascinating why people choose their their discipline so thank you very much what is your most challenging thing about your current role we are working in project management field and project management field is always a challenging always means every day you have lots of lots of challenges because team size is big you need to handle more than 300 400 people so handling people itself is a challenge many a times a team there are some confrontation in the team many a times there are some confrontation with client with vendors with other stakeholder of the project so solving those confrontation and getting to the resolution is also very challenging i i used to say my peers and my colleagues that in project management when you come in the morning you have lots and lots of on your table and despite a lot of hard work and uh, dedication when you go back to home you find that your challenges are more than what you found in morning so means issues and challenges never gets over when you are in project management role and uh, project engineering role sometimes you know I would say that managing vendors also is a very big challenge okay because uh, we cannot produce or manufacture everything in our uh, workshop we have to have our vendors our suppliers to complete the project and the suppliers have their own priorities they they may have some different priorities than our project priority so uh, then uh, we need to convince uh, the supplier and we need to talk to suppliers on regular basis and support them so that they don't fall back in their plan thank you i have another question for mix a good leader and what is your philosophy for managing your team the best the best way of managing the team is first of all we need to know the each and every individual their potentials their skills their gaps so when we know their potentials and their skills we can assign the work as per the skills and potential they have and wherever they have some gaps we need to complement to the team members okay. sometimes sometimes it may have a case that you means as an individual i know more than my team uh, team member and my team member may not be expert enough in uh, that particular area so in that case it's better to complement rather than criticizing guy you even don't know what you are doing so complementing mm-hmm. each other is a uh, most important and then second which i prefer trust team so if we have trust on the team members we understand their personal and professional problem we can easily overcome many inter personal issues with the team members and ultimately we all are human being okay so we have emotions we know how to manage the so so we need to have trust we need to complement each other that's really good advice thank you what is your zone genius what are you really good at i am technically very good i know my subject very well i have good techno commercial understanding i can manage a team more than even 500 people i have managed uh, the client i have managed pmc i have managed even licensor okay so mm-hmm. the the best quality which i would say that i am very inclusive to i normally in- involve each and every stakeholder of the project for the common goal for the success of the project and for me success is not it's a success of contractor this is the success of contractor and the client too because okay. you know if if as a contractor if i am successful but as a client if someone if my client is not getting output or not getting benefit from the project then 
I will not be able to get repeat order, and I am putting my reputation of the organizers on this on this deck. So I generally involve every team members in the project task to achieve the common goal. And common goal is success of the project. Success of the project is not only for contractor; it's for client also. So client should also get benefit out of the project. See the. project for which the uh, the purpose of the project should be uh, ma- made for client and contractor too mm-hmm. okay. okay so uh, i would say that yeah if you ask me about the skills the ma- most uh, important skill i would say that i'm very honest and yeah i uh, work hard to achieve the uh, goals and i'm very inclusive and i take all the team members along to get the success thank you you sound like an amazing boss by the way i just have to to, to say that you i'm pretty sure that your colleagues would be very blessed to have you as a manager i just want yes this is true michel uh, you are right means like when i am i have a record in my organization that not only current organization colleagues and juniors my previous organization and colleagues juniors also wanted to work me with me even now also yeah, so then. i normally wanted to be a role model for my peers for my seniors and for my juniors also it sounds like you're doing a really good job of that yeah thank you so much yeah who do you depend on the most in your work okay most depend uh, in my work actually project control so there is another discipline uh, when we are executing the project so project control is another uh, another area which are normally working as the ears and eyes of the project they tell us how the project is being executed where we are heading where are the gaps and how we need to catch up the project requirements so my dependency would always be on project control when i am executing the project and they really very helpful and based on their uh, analysis sorry based on their uh, uh, i would say that to finding i do analysis and i i normally take action to correct if we are going wrong so i am just giving you the example like if i am uh, lagging in my schedule okay mm-hmm. if some of the activities are not being executed as planned so my project control comes and tell me that pravesh this is where this is these are the deliverables which we are not even progressing and uh, these are the timelines okay so i normally see why we could not able to produce these deliverables what are the roadblocks and if there are no roadblocks then how we can catch up the progress in future okay so my project control team comes and tell me that the, the, these are the area where we should focus on and i analyze it further for the benefit of the project i sit together with my team members and i urge them to take action so that we can catch the progress and then we can uh, deliver as planned and if there are some thing which are creating problems uh, by vendors or by suppliers or by client or by pmc then i take it to, to them and i request them to support us so that we can deliver the requirements as plan and we can achieve the purpose of the project that was really interesting a really good uh, really good message to send across who do you delegate to what type of what type of work do you delegate Okay, so like okay, as I said, that project is always executed by a team, and all the team members have roles and responsibility. They have their task assigned, they have the timelines, and they they know the cost also and the quality requirement, quality and safety requirement. So we we need to delegate the project activities to the disciplines. Okay, so that they can start working on deliverables and deliver as planned as a project manager 
i integrate the project i understand what input they need and how they will achieve it i make all sort of arrangement for them so that they straight forward start working on the project delegation is an important part of any of the project execution and we need to delegate because you know one man cannot execute complete project we have to have a team to execute it and the team know the roles and responsibility in the project generally i delegate the work related to project management to my project engineers mm-hmm. say i am telling you like we have normally when we are executing the epc project we have engineering discipline in engineering discipline we have process engineering we have hse engineering we have mechanical engineering we have piping we have civil electrical instrumentation and then we have work project control we have quality people to um, to manage the quality we have inspection we have suppliers okay so we need to delegate the activities and as per the rules we need to assign a project engineer for day to day activities for small project yes one project engineering manager or one project manager can solve the issues of the team members directly but when we are handling big project or mega project if everybody comes to me then probably 24 hours will not be enough for me in a day okay so we delegate the engineering discipline to project engineer we have uh, a project engineer for su- managing the suppliers we have a project engineer for managing the subcontractors we have project engineer for managing uh, the pre commissioning and commissioning activities we have project engineer for managing discipline specific uh, needs okay and sometimes we need to have a project engineer to manage the contract as well did i answer your question you did and it was really good it was really it was actually really informative actually because you went through all the yes. different uh, roles of everybody and how you would delegate them so it was quite a, a really good answer actually so thank you very much i was just thinking of another question as you were saying before that you work for an epc i just wondered if you could tell me in your opinion what the differences are between working for the epc design company and the client because there must be a lot of a big differences because i have worked for the client and epc contractors before so and there is a big difference to what differences do you find yeah. there is yeah there yes. must be a big difference yes it's a very big difference uh, michel you rightly pointed out uh, that there are very big difference when we are working for the contractor and when we are working for the client as i said i started my career with hindustan zinc limited and hindustan zinc limited is a basically client company so we normally when i was in hindustan zinc limited we used to assign or award a contract to a contractor to execute the project for us okay mm-hmm. whereas when we are working as a contractor we have a contract documents and we execute the project as per the con- uh, contract document requirement the very big difference between the client and epc company is like client want a project and client financially uh, you know when client is coming up with the project they normally analyze the npv irr and return on investment for any project so they do financial analysis before they coming up with the project so uh, when they are uh, when they have award any project to the contractor their prime motto is how they can get their return on investment as soon as possible so they always have pressing targets because you know they wanted to start the production as soon as possible because for them bread and butter is not a project bread and butter is producing anything it may be producing oil and gas it may be producing mines it may be producing metal hardly makes difference so if oil and gas operator like i am giving you the example of total 
if total is coming up with any of the project he will always think to complete the project as soon as possible so that whatever the money he has borrowed from any lenders he can pay them back number 1 and first of all he can start the production as soon as possible so if he has a timeline to complete any project in 6 years that means that project has to be completed in 6 years so that from 6 year day uh, one day he, he should be in a position to start the production and he should be in a position to sell oil and gas to the customers so that he can start earning the revenue okay so till 6 year the client is spending money without getting any returns okay on the contrary if any contractor who is executing the project he starts getting the money from probably as per payment terms let us assume that from 6th month of the project start okay so for the contractor executing contract is the bread and butter for him and he makes or lose the money in executing of the contract whereas operator or client they start earning the money once the project is finished number 1 and they start selling the oil and gas to the consumer okay mm-hmm. so this is the first difference major difference number 1 number 2 risk taken by uh, operator is more always more than risk of the contractor because contractor risk is always limited to ld means liquid and liquidated damages there are damages okay so ld is generally 5% to 7.5% of the contract value so to the maximum he can get ld if he has uh, quoted adequately then he will not lose money in the contract yes if some some contractor do aggressive bidding and get the project and uh, then later on they start facing the problem in executing the project then many contractor may make losses but if they do so then they are probably they are not financially sustainable okay so financially sustainable is always a prime for any of the uh, company mm-hmm. so the risk is always limited uh, in uh, executing the contract by the contractor but risk involved by the operator is more than more for the operator than uh, for the client sorry risk uh, risk involved is more for client than the contractor and one more important point which i would like to highlight here is mm-hmm. like environmental clearances nowadays everyone is very keen and serious on the environmental uh, clearances and uh, they don't want to uh, any government or any public or any operator will not prefer to damage the environment they wanted to build a project which is environmental safe as well so in case in during operation if operator make some little mistakes and if uh, that mistake if that mistake creates some environmental issue that may even shut the operation of the complete plant uh, you may hear that 5 6 years back i don't remember exactly which year it happened you know british petroleum uh, oil was leaked in uh, north sea yes yeah yeah and i think it was it a north sea or Me- mexico sea yeah yeah it was north sea yes correct so british petroleum oil was leaked in uh, pipeline oil was leaked in north sea and due to this you know british petroleum uh, i think 40 billion dollar penalty was in imp- was on british petroleum which was okay. very used and because of this reason you know british petroleum financially is is, is yet is struggling so means it's uh, for operator the risk involvement is always more than the client more than the contractor contractor risk is always limited and it is limited only for the limited period till the time they execute and finish the project whereas the risk for operator is till the time they operate and they produce oil and gas okay am i clear uh, yes you are yes you are very clear but even the type of work that you do in 
an EPC contractor compared to the type of work that you do as when you're working for the client, it's quite different as well. Because when you work for the EPC contractor, you're more doing the design. It's more design work that you're, yeah, yeah. One of my final questions is, if you could turn back time, would you change anything? Would you do anything okay. differently? Yes, I would do something differently. I under, uh, means uh, if I turn back time, I would say that uh, I would love to execute the project differently than what uh, how I have executed them before. I'm giving you the examples because many yeah. times it be easy to explain with the examples. Then uh, uh, okay, apart from uh, the catastrophe which I shared with you for uh, compressor foundation and uh, furnace, uh, I would like to share um, other examples. Okay, like. First of all, when we execute the project, we need to identify the gray area of the contract very clearly. Every contract has some gray area. No contract is perfect in the world. But we as a contractor and as a client, we need to understand the sanctity of the gray area. And we need to address those gray area at the beginning of the project. I am giving you the example of Mozambique LNG. Mm -hmm. When I was executing the Mozambique LNG as a project engineering manager from Medermot, the Mozambique LNG is being executed by three contractors. One is uh, CBNI, which is now Medermot, and then mm -hmm. uh, Chioda Corporation, and then Saipem. Saipem is the uh, leader in this project. And uh, Saipem is having 75% of the uh, contract value strike. And uh, CBNI is having close to 24.5% and then balance 5.5% with Chioda Corporation. You know, when we started this project, I told my counterpart in Saipem, not once, twice and thrice, that guys, it's better if we go back and tell Anadarko. Anadarko was, uh, if you recall, uh, this Mozambique LNG was originally with Anadarko. And then Anadarko sold its, uh, I would say, stack to Occidental. Then Occidental became the owner of the uh, Anadarko. And then Occidental eventually sold the stack to Total for Mozambique. Okay. So that time, Anadarko was owner of the project. And I told them that Mozambique is a very terrorist prone area and terrorist attack can occur at any point of time. So, you know, why don't we go with modularization design than stick build? Michelle, if you understand modularize and stick build, or should I explain yeah. it a bit? You can explain it, but I understand it. But if you can explain yeah, it, okay. that would be great. So, you know what, in a strict build design, we normally construct everything at site. We norm, we don't do any, any pre-constructed uh, pipe rack or pre-constructed structure or pre-constructed module and uh, transport it to the site. It's all, everything will be executed at site. That is how we do in strict build. Means the structural steel will be, structural steel will be built based on stick. Means stick by stick, it will be built right whereas in modularized design what we do is we normally prepare a modular for for a section at offshore means like uh, probably it's not at site it will be module will be uh, uh, fabricated at somewhere around in far east asia or india or sometimes it is in indonesia thailand there are so many uh, fabrication yards in uh, far east asia which are even uh, cheaper also and which can fabricate as per our timeline. Okay, so what we do is we, we, uh, we, build, uh, we build the plant in modular sections and we transport the entire module through C and the transported module will be installed at site with minimum labors. Okay, so like Supposedly, if we require 10,000 odd construction people at site during strict build design, we may even need 1,000 uh, labors for modularized uh, design. But the only issue with modularization is 
modularization is bit costly it involves 15 to 20% more cost than strict build but it has several advantages like it can speed up your project in uh, you can complete the project in shorter timeline it can reduce the cost of fabrication or cost of labor at site because you know uh, uh, if you are doing a construction at america or if you are doing a construction at australia where the labor cost is very costly okay then it is always better to go with modularization okay fabricate the module at far east asian countries and transport it through sea to the site and in that uh, way you can easily save 15 20% of the cost so you can nullify the increase of cost or rather you can even save a cost of epc project when you are doing modularization in the countries where the labor cost labor is costly i gave the suggestion to saipam and uh, team over there and i requested them can we approach client and request them to think over it whether we should go with modularization or strict build so that time you know my suggestion was turned down because uh, uh, because of financial reasons because it is going to increase around 20 to 25% of the epc cost but you know what happened we completed the project uh, we started the project and we completed around 75% of our engineering we procured long lead items and we procured critical equipments as well and you know uh, in uh, january and 2020 march there were two consecutive insurgency attack on the site and i think we lost around 50 or 60 construction labor eventually this project is suspended for more it will be suspended for more than 2 years because now it is heard that we will be starting this project again in q2 next year Okay. so somewhere around may june next year we will start this project again but the fact is had we taken this decision that time probably we would have not encountered encount- uh, sorry encounter such issues now and okay. we could have probably we could have we, we could have been in a position to complete the project well within the time thank you very much that was really good insight it was a really good answer actually thank you very much that's all the questions i have today I would like to thank Travish for your time. That brings us to the end of another episode. Thank you for listening and see you next week. That brings us to the end of another episode. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, I'd like to gently encourage you to leave a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts and share the show with another person. You can also follow me on LinkedIn or via my website, www.michellefraserconsultancy.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.